So we have three cases today. Um, so for the first one, it's an outside case and I will present the history myself. And so this is from a 51 year old female patient. She has history of triple negative breast cancer and recent rash. Um, she was on Kichuda pembrolizumab uh, at that time. And there was clinical concern for ATN, AIN, or C3 glomerulopathy or some kind of polycytopathy, but they think it's probably less uh, likely because she doesn't have any um, pertinuria. And creatinine uh, increased from baseline to uh, 0.7 to 2.44 and peak at 3.68 milligram per deciliter. Uh, UPCR was at 0.15 gram. Um, this is a urine segment finding. Complement levels. So um, I don't know if our nephrology colleagues want to comment on anything or about the differential. Um, feel free if you have any thoughts. How long ago was the Pembro started? Oh, that's a good question. I wish I, I know more about this. Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a there's a comment in the in the chat from a ball, um, a GN from PD1 blocker. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's what it um, turned out to be. So I'm gonna show you the pathology findings. Um, so this is the core we got, the, the renal biopsy. So we have two fragments of renal cortex and on each level section, there are either 11, 11 to 14 glomerulipo level section and all of them are patent. So at low power, I mean, there might be some, um, it's not very clear, but it, low power might be some IFTA going on. Uh, and then this is a slightly higher magnification of the renal core. So as you can see here, in between the tubule um, parenchyma, it looks very busy. Uh, and you wonder what these are. It might be some inflammatory cells poking around like here and there, but overall the chronic injury was a little bit hard to tell. I don't really see a lot of atrophic tubules. Um, let's go to higher power. So as we suspected, in between the two wheels, there are quite some uh, inflammatory cells. Here is mainly lymphoplasmacytic cells. So um, those really dark, um, those cells with dark nuclei, either round or slightly elongated, those are the those are the lymph uh, those are the lymphocytes. And this is a good plasma cells here, uh, a little bit cytoplasm. Um, Kind of have more uh, cytoplasm here, and in addition to the interstitial information, what we, all, we could also appreciate is the tubulitis, and it's more kind of lymphocytic in nature. Um, they are infiltrating within the epithelium here, and there is also some evidence of uh, acute kidney injury. This is probably a mitotic figure. I have uh, I have a, a high magnification to show you the AKI. So again, more tubulitis as highlighted here. Yeah, here's more. And then this is kind of a tubulitis at higher magnification. As you can see those dark stained um, lymphocytes infiltrating the epithelial cells. And this one is even showing a little bit perinuclear halo here. And then, um, yeah, this is a major finding of the biopsy. There are um, quite some interstitial information and lymphocytic and tubulitis and also AKI here where you could see um, dilatation of the lumen and also uh, attenuation of the epithelium and it, with a little bit cytoplasmic vacuolization here. Yeah, more uh, of the tubulitis. This is a lymphocyte infiltrating the tubular epithelium. And then for the glomerulus, as I mentioned, all of them are patent. They look pretty unremarkable. Um, we don't really see any um, active lesions like uh, necrosis or crescent. 
And then this is a high magnification of the glomerulus where you could see um, the patent glomerular tufts and the glomerular basement membrane, they are thin ribbon-like and remarkable, and there's no hypercellularity within the um, mesangium or endocapillary, or there, there's no extra uh, capillary hypercellularity as well. And this is the EM finding. Uh, in some area, it look, looks like the glomerular basement membrane is on the kind of a thin end, but it's not like um, definite for thin basement membrane disease for us. Um, uh, in addition, there uh, the podocytes, they look overall um, unremarkable. And then when we did the measurement of glomerular basement membrane th uh, thickness at high magnification, it shows 247, um, which is above our threshold for, to diagnose a thin basement membrane disease in female patient, which is 215 a nanometer. So she, did, she didn't meet the criteria for thin basement membrane disease. And this is the final diagnosis. So there is acute tuber interstitial nephritis and AKI, uh, at least mild and IFTA, and there's also uh, mild arterial sclerosis. So as we know, the patient uh, was treated with Keytruda, and the findings are most uh, consistent with um, those pathologies uh, like AKI and ATI and acute tuber interstitial nephritis related to the immune checkpoint inhibitor exposure. So for immune checkpoint inhibitor related kidney injury, um, for acute kidney injury, the incidence is about 1.4 to 4.9%. And the so-called immune-related adverse uh, events, it, less, it happens less frequently in kidney, but it does happen. And when it happens, uh, the tuber interstitial nephritis is the most common pathologic feature in the kidney. As we see in the current case, we also see the acute tuber interstitial nephritis. And very importantly, it can be treated um, by corticosteroids. And for other... Um, in addition to the tuber interstitial uh, injury, it can have other glomerulopathies. Uh, and uh, reporting the literature, there could be membranous nephrop um, nephropathy and the C3 IgA or even amyloidosis. Uh, so specifically for pembrolizumab, uh, as used in this patient based on the monocentric large case series study. So what they found is that the acute tuber interstitial nephritis, AEIN, and minimal change disease uh, are the most frequent forms of kidney involvement. And the median duration of use, um, as asked by um, uh, in the, when we discuss about the differential diagnosis, so the median duration um, is nine months. It ranges from one to 24 months up to the beginning of treatment. So it would be interesting to find um, when the patient was on or started on the um, pembrolizumab in the current case. And 12 patients out of the uh, 676 pembrolizumab treated patients, so the incidence is kind of low, it's 1.77%. And out of the 12 patients, 10 had uh, AKI and two had proteinuria. So the biopsy findings include uh, four AIN, uh, five ATI, one minimal change disease plus ATI, and one minimal change disease alone. And this is a hypothetical um, mechanism for the um, for the immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, induced. Uh, AIN in the kidney. So what happens is that when you uh, look at the left panel, which shows you the, uh, the um, more kind of pathologic um, process. So for PD-1, there are two uh, ligands. One is pd one the other is pd 2 pd 2 is um, more, pd one is expressed in immune and not immune cells, and pd one L2 is expressed primarily in the dendritic cells and the macrophages. Um, and for the um, activation of T cells, it needs the TCR binding to the epitype and MHC molecules, and also the co-stimulating uh, molecules. And this process is 
uh, regulated by the PD-1 pathway. It's kind of inhibited by PD-1 pathway. Uh, and also the effect of T cells, so what, what it, um, the function, the main function is to protect unlimited, uh, like unwanted inflammatory response. It's kind of more protective role uh, in the pathologic um, process. So when you add the anti-PD-1 uh, monoclonal antibodies, this inhibitory and um, protective um, role of PD-1 uh, is not there anymore. And that will lead to um, downstream kind of unlimited inflammatory response. So in the animal models, it's more um, kind of uh, autoimmune variant or interstitial nephritis. Um, so that's why you will see this lymphocytic, lymphocytic tubulitis uh, within the pretty well-preserved uh, tubular interstitial parenchyma. So any questions for the first case or should we save the case uh, questions at the end? No, I think we should probably do, you know, sort of um, questions with each case. Um, oh, okay, for you. okay, yeah. that sounds good. So any, any questions for this one, this case? I'm just curious whether the hypocomplementemia and um, you know, the, uh, the hematuria are common features here. I think those were um, sort of misguiding uh, Dr. Corral as a, a differential. Yeah. Yes, I mean, um, on the biopsy itself, we didn't see like definitive features pointing to that direction. Um, we don't see any kind of RBC cas. And as we mentioned, like for the glomerular basement membrane, if it's like thin basement membrane disease, we um, could see some kind of hematuria. But we uh, we had some suspicion initially, but after measurement, it doesn't meet the criteria for thin basement membrane disease. I don't think I have a very good explanation um, for those uh, findings. Uh, Yuan, did you have a feeling that uh, some of those peritular capillaries, they have fibrin thrombi in them? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I see your point. I didn't mention it while I was um, talking about the, um, like here is one. Um, actually, this is not the only one. There are other areas which shows the peri, uh, those thrombi in the peritoral capillaries. So what we think is, um, you know, when um, there is ATI, there can be concurrent thrombi within the peritoneal capillaries. Um, so we suspect it's, it could be like related to the AT, uh, ATI. Okay, yeah, it's a, uh, ANCA was negative, correct? In this case. Um, it, it was not, I'm not sure if it's down even. Okay. Yeah. Yuan, do you know if this patient recovered her kidney function after this kidney injury? That's a very good question. We were actually trying to find out if there is any follow-up um, for this patient. I know but... that Dr. Malik participated in a multi-center study led by David Leaf and Shruti Gupta, and they found about 65% of patients treated with PD-1 inhibitors had recovery of their AKI, especially if steroids were included in the treatment of yes. that AKI. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I'm just interested in how she did. Yeah. Um, I, we don't have a follow-up information for this patient, unfortunately, but as you mentioned, like it's reported in the literature, um, for those patients, um, who were, who have been treated with stories, I mean, majority of them can be recovered pretty well. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that will be the same for, for this patient as well. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Bilal. Um, so yeah, I think there is in general uh, one third, one third rule here as well. Uh, one third mm -hmm. almost completely recover. One third don't if they have very severe disease and then one third kind of to some degree and leaves a little bit behind. Uh, so, but yes, more than 60, 65% of the patients will have some recovery after a uh, course of steroids. And the earlier we do the steroids, the, um, the better the outcomes are in this case as well. So a couple of other points quickly. The 
duration, the lag between giving the medication and uh, occurrence of immune nephritis is usually around three to four months. I would say probably not nine. Nine is on the longer end of the spectrum. Although having said that, uh, we have encountered patients after one dose and some after about a year and a half as well. So it's mm -hmm. all over the map, but in general, the vast majority are presented between three and four months uh, of uh, getting this uh, treatment. Uh, and finally, to the point of the urinary abnormalities, what we found was that it was all over the map. Uh, none of the findings, whether hematuria, proteinuria, even leukocytes for that matter, uh, did kind of sort of did not uh, correlate with the with the severity or or or, or the presentation. <laughs> in fact, some of the uh, uh, patients that we I have seen in clinic, uh, their uh, reported urinalyses are completely blind uh, with, mm -hmm. with nothing in the sediment, and I've had to look at their sediment to to find out the no no they have a lot of pyuria and and maybe a white cell cast here and there. So yeah, it's it's a tough one. We there is not no lab that's going to be telling us that this exactly is happening. We'll just have to keep our index of suspicion high and look at the urine sediment. I I would reiterate that. Okay, so the, I, I guess the key thing is to do a renal biopsy, right? <laughs> uh, yes, if we can. I, I'm trying to, I'm, I've moved to the point of doing kidney biopsies in people in where I'm, uh, I'm not clear about the diagnosis or there are other uh, uh, chemo drugs that have a similar potential of injury. For example, mm -hmm. many patients get pemetrexid uh, uh, together with pembrolizumab as part of uh, their chemo regimen, and that is pretty toxic as well. Mm -hmm. And so in, in difficult cases like those, I uh, have done biopsy uh, just to prove as to which one of the agents uh, are, is causing the problem. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay. I think I will move on to the... Um, Second case, thank you all for the questions and comments. For this one, uh, is Eric online? Yep, I'm here. Okay, Very would awesome. you like to share your screen or use? I have yours in uh, incorporate to mine as well. Um, yeah, you can just click away. I, there's some animations, but we'll, yeah. Go okay. okay. Um, so this is a case that uh, we saw on the consult service at University of Washington Montlake. Um, last week and into this week. So 49 year old woman with history of uh, multivessel coronary artery disease, HEF-REF, EF of 41%, diabetes and hypertension. Um, she presented on May 5th to an outside hospital um, with shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, decreased PO intake. Um, for three days and she'd been, you know, felt very dehydrated. You know, she didn't have any fevers or chills and no urinary symptoms. Um, and then she was taking all of her medications, including metformin at the time of presentation. Um, and then um, it's a little unclear from documentation exactly her course in the ED. She seemed to be normotensive per the vitals charts, but because she was so profoundly volume depleted, they contacted a local nephrologist and um, administered aggressive fluid resuscitation because her labs strikingly showed a creatinine of 10, a BUN 136. Um, her lactate was unmeasurable greater than 10 with an anion gap greater than 46. Um, her bicarb was recorded as less than five and her pH on an ABG was 7.04. Um, she, uh, like I said, received aggressive fluids and uh, in total six liters as they tried contacting other facilities that would have a higher level of care because their facility was not um, able, compatible to do dialysis. Um, her white count was 32.4, but again, afebrile and um, Plates, platelets were 700s, getting the sense that she was um, very hemoconcentrated. Um, she, within 24 hours, was transferred to UW Montlake. And I will just give a kind of give away um, 
it's not not as relevant to the the actual biopsy, but uh, if you click next, uh, they did check a metformin level and it was elevated, um, which may have been the culprit for her lactic acidosis. Uh, metformin level was 10 with a normal range of one to two and that, that just came back a couple days ago. Um, so her baseline creatinine months ago was one. I'll talk a little more about her course over the past few months. Um, her past milk history diabetes was diagnosed a bit over a year ago, but it seemed to potentially have been more longstanding. She did have evidence of retinopathy documented on an uh, ophthalmologic evaluation recently. Um, and she does have neuropathy. She's currently on metformin, no insulin. Uh, she had, at that time, it, a year ago, presented with an NSTEMI and hypertensive emergency. It didn't seem like she had established care and had a left heart cath that showed multivessel coronary artery disease that has been managed medically and her EF is uh, 35%. Um, she'd been receiving Entresto and Spironolactone um, and, um, and goal-directed medical management. Her family history is just significant for diabetes and hypertension. Um, no history of smoking, um, and yeah, she lives in Wenatchee. Um, her medications, I mentioned metformin, um, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. She's also on aspirin, atorvastatin, Jardians, um, magnesium. She was started on a PPI a few months ago in January, um, and then I'll get to, but she had been on Entresto and Spironolactone, which had been held back in March because of a acute kidney injury and declining kidney function. Um, can click next. And so um, she, her, with her presentation and transferring to UW, she did have cultures, urine culture and blood cultures, which grew Klebsiella. Um, and so there, there's an explanation a bit of her acute illness, but looking back when we were consulted, um, she actually hist historically over the past few months has had a decline in, in her kidney function. So her, I said her baseline creatinine was around one in December. Um, she had a urinalysis at that time, no protein, no blood. Um, and then in February, on, it seems a routine blood draw, her creatinine was elevated at 2.58. Um, in March, March 9th, she presented with a urinary tract infection with dysuria um, to a local hospital and was admitted with an AKI. Her creatinine was 3.32. She was hyperkalemic. And a urinalysis then showed um, uh, one plus blood, one plus protein, and uh, her her urine culture grew Klebsiella at that time. She was treated with cefalexin times seven days, and she established with a nephrologist. Um, in their evaluation, they felt it was somewhat unclear why, why um, she had this severe of an AKI, and they attributed to vol potentially volume depletion, the saying of UTI and also being on Entresto and Spironolactone. So Entresto and Spironolactone were held in March. After holding those agents, she had repeat blood work. April 14th, her creatinine remained elevated 2.55. May 1st, creatinine was 3.14. Um, I mentioned the urine culture results now presenting with Klebsiella, bacteremia, and, and UTI. Um, her urinalysis showed two plus protein, three plus blood, and her urine protein creatinine ratio was 4.8 with really a minimal urine albumin creatinine ratio, unmeasurably low. Um, at the outset, we sent off a preliminary GN workup. The serologies were uh, negative. C3 was mildly low at 84 and C4 was normal. Um, and then 
her ultrasound of her kidneys was really unremarkable. She didn't have any evidence of fat stranding. I just reviewed it again with radiology and no radiographic evidence of pyelonephritis or hydro. And a repeat echo, her TT showed her uh, EF is 42%. Um, um, so again, yeah, on arrival, urine culture, blood culture with Klebsiella. She was started on ceftriaxone. Her lactate actually downtrended pretty quickly and her acidosis resolved with bicarb administration. Her hemoglobin was as low as 5.5 um, after receiving fluid resuscitation. And so she received transfusions. And then the days that followed, her creatinine remained elevated. It was slightly improved. She was non oliguric with robust urine output, but um, BUN remained in the 160s. The decision was made to go forward and plan for kidney biopsy, uh, given the subacute decline in kidney function uh, that remained somewhat unclear in the background. Her, um, she was started on dialysis really to address her uremia in the preparation for biopsy. So she did receive two sessions and she remained on antibiotics for uh, receiving about six days um, at the time and then underwent renal biopsy on May 12th. Okay, thank you. Um... Hey Eric, uh, was the patient on hydralazine? Uh, no, they were not. Okay. It seems like most of the proteinuria was was not albuminuria, right? That's right. Yeah, it was um, UPCR 4.8, so non-albuminuric proteinuria. Okay, and this is what we got. So um, we have two cores of renal cortex. It's really a very nice sample. We have 20, uh, 32 to 35 grumel like per level section and um, about one to two, three to nine percent agogly sclerosed. And when we go to higher power, um, so it's similar. It's, so this case is actually a nice contrast from the pathology point of view um, compared to the first case. So in between those two bills, uh, you do see some like busy and things going on. You wonder what these could be. And also at low power, you could see uh, some IFTA. There are some atrophic tubules here and here. So there is scattered some uh, chronic injury. Um, and then some um, glomeruli in between those tubular interstitial parenchyma, they look um, unremarkable at lower power, but we're gonna take a further look at higher power. So this is what we see from higher magnification. So this group, they actually show a little bit mesangial sclerosis segmentally. It's uh, kind of nodular, which correlate with um, the clinical history of um, diabetes. And then um, for the tuber interstitial parenchyma, what we uh, could see is that there are some um, lymphoplasmocytic interstitial information and Focal activity is appreciated as well. This is uh, actually a tubulitis um, here. So what else? So this is kind of more for tubulitis. Um, and in addition to the lymphocytic tubulitis, you could see those polylobated um, neutrophils infiltrating the tuber epithelium as well. So, um, which means there is neutrophilic tubulitis. And also within the interstitial, you could see those neutrophils um, here and there. Um, we have a, like here, this one probably in the, in the vessel. Um, so this is more a more florid finding where you could see those neutrophilic casts within the tubal lumens. And here within the interstitial, you see these, you could see these neutrophilic aggregates uh, also here. So there is evidence of neutrophilic casts and neutrophilic aggregates. Um, and in addition, there is evidence of acute tuber injury. So as shown here, the tubules, um, they have dilated lumen and also attenuation of these uh, epithelium here. Variation of loss of brush border as well. 
and this looks like a magnetic figure, but not exactly certain. Um, again, you could see those uh, interstitial information. This area is more like uh, lympho lymphoplasmacytic instead of neutrophilic. Yeah, again, on the acute tuber injury. So this is actually a mitotic figure uh, here, which is nice. Um, and then um, what, what else we found is that um, the lymphocytic, so it's mainly like lymphocytic information infiltrate, they're actually involving um, the fibroconnective tissue of the renal capsule. As you can see here, this scattered infiltrate um, present within the fibroconnective tissue. So IF finding is um, kind of negative and on EM, we don't see any immune deposits. And what we found is uh, the mildly thickened um, GBM, which could be seen in early diabetic nephropathy. And there is focal effacement of podocyte foot processes. So the final diagnosis is there is tuber interstitial nephritis with features of acute pyelonephritis. The reason we uh, say that is because there is evidence of um, neutrophilic cast, neutrophilic tubulitis, and also neutrophilic rich interstitial information. And there's ATI. Um, and the pro um, chronic parenchymal injury is at least mild. So in addition for the glomeruli, there is morphologic early diabetic nephropathy uh, and also focal global glomerular sclerosis, is, which is kind of very uh, three to 9%. And for the vascular changes, mild arterial sclerosis and mild to moderate arterial halinosis. So we think um, this finding could correlate with the patient uh, recent urinary tract infection based on all these um, active uh, features and injuries. Uh, we are concerned about the intrarenal infection or pyelonephritis. But as we mentioned, um, the image finding didn't support that. Um, so for acute pyelonephritis, this is kind of a review. For acute pyelonephritis, it's for the pathology definition is there is acute superlative information of the renal parenchyma. But for when we say acute superlative, it means there is neutrophilic. So neutrophilic infiltrate and neutrophilic information and also tubulitis. And also clinically, there could be um, microorganism like established from the culture study or other studies and two possible um, routes of infection, uh, either ascending infection or hematogenous spread um, to the kidney. So direct infection of the kidney um, for bacterial infection, um, for acute pyelonephritis, Klebsiella, which was found uh, in the current case, uh, is kind of one of the organisms involved in the ascending um, infection of the kidney. Other things are um, E. coli, proteus, or enterobacter. And for the um, blood spread, it could be E. coli or staphylococcus. And microscopic features, uh, what we could see is, uh, as shown on the left side here, the so-called neutrophil tagging and the neutrophilic um, tubulitis, which means the neutrophils is infiltrating the tuber epithelium. So more here, neutrophilic um, tagging and neutrophilic tubulitis. The tagging is more kind of surrounding or um, within the tuber basement membrane and um, neutrophilic casts within the tuber lumens. So in more severe cases, um, we could see the uh, abscess formation. Um, so here is a small abscess formation and the surrounding tubules, they're showing these neutrophilic casts within the tuber lumens. It's kind of rare to see the uh, abscess formation in, in the liver biopsy. I mean, some, sometimes we do see those in autopsy cases. So for differential diagnosis, from a pathology point of view, it's, it's 
there are quite some differential diagnoses here. Um, sometimes for the tubal rupture, we could see the neutrophilic information. It's kind of more a non-specific feature. So we have to see how the extent, if it's involved in area uh, where there is no tubal rupture. And also for other non-infectious uh, etiologies, for example, the oxalate nephropathy and also light chain cast uh, nephropathy, we could see very florid interstitial neutrophils and even neutrophilic tubulitis. Um, so those could be part of the non-infectious um, processes and doesn't mean too much that there is infectious um, things going on. And also for the severe acute tubular interstitial nephritis, it's common to have the neutrophilic infiltrates. However, it's usually diffuse quality involvement. Um, in, uh, on, on the other hand, the infection related is more kind of segmental or zonal distribution. And um, usually it's um, unilateral. Um, and for us, we feel like it's very important to have the clinical correlation. Um, okay, any any question for this case? I know we had some discussion yesterday during the um, biopsy conference. Yeah, I can just comment on the discussion yesterday. So as you saw, this this presentation had really two phases. One was this kind of subacute acute kidney injury early in the year, and then this very florid presentation with the creatinine of 10 and the, and the uh, acute kidney injury, presumably with this acute pyelonephritis and ATN. So one of the questions in my mind is, did this patient have an underlying tubular interstitial nephritis from something else, possibly her PPI or some other uh, component going on for the first few months, and then had a second hit that give her the neutrophilic interstitial nephritis. Um, I was struck by the degree of chronicity on the biopsy um, that uh, clearly she had some injury going on for some time. Yeah, I, um, as we discussed yesterday, it's kind of hard for us to tell apart which is first and which is second. It's kind of an evolving process here. There is some chronicity, but um, the active injury is still like there. There's um, ATI and also these neutrophilic um, tubulitis and um, in the interstitial information, uh, all these neutrophilic has. Um, so I would say both are there, but it's hard for us to um, point like which one is first and which one is second. Yeah, I haven't seen actually these uh, the slides except for the ones that were shown yesterday and um, and today Yuan is showing. But looking at the pattern of um, of, of cro chronic injury, it's more kind of like widespread rather than nephrocentric. That when there is like a glomerular involvement as the cause, uh, we see more the atrophic tubules more. Uh, basically mm -hmm. centering the glomeruli, going around the glomeruli. And here it's kind of like, okay, we have a more widespread phenomenon that is more suggestive of uh, tubular interstitial or chronic ischemic injury, which is uh, basically more proximal to what, what we are seeing. So it might be, I mean, I, either, either I would say an acute tubular injury that is going into into more chronic phases or chronic tubular interstitial as you suggested, because of the PPI or something else, um, sounds to me like the more likely scenario for chronic in the background. I, I have a question for the nephrologist. So, I mean, I, I've always uh, been telling myself that like a creatinine of 11 is something that I shouldn't try to explain uh, or attribute to an acute pyelonephritis. So it's usually very patchy and oftentimes unilateral. Mm. So, you know, the finding of acute pyelonephritis and the chronic injury here is, I think, a, you know, a definite histologic finding and pathologic finding, but I, I don't 
you know, in my mind, that really doesn't provide a great explanation for a creatinine of 11. Yeah, I think she was also back to remake and somewhat hypotensive when she first presented. And we thought there was an ATN component as well for this AKI. Yeah. And the acute tubular injury is also more widespread than um, than pyelo. Is that correct, or or no, Yuan? Or you were seeing features of pyelo more widespread in the biopsy? My impression is um, is the ATI is more widespread than the um, like the features of the pyelo, like acute pyelo, acute pyelo. I mean, there are area that is more prominent with neutrophilic um, aggregates in the interstitial and neutrophilic cast, but these are like focal. It's not that like everywhere. We ha I have to look for it. It's more pronounced in one lab, one focus than other. Yeah. So no more question for this one. Um, then yeah, I I'll... can just comment um, that yeah, she actually um, her kidney function kind of stabilized, uh, improved a bit, and then stabilized at a creatinine of three. So she's off dialysis, uh, and um, she's she's now discharged, but completed a course of antibiotics, um, and she'll follow up with her local nephrologist in Wenatchee. But um, yeah, her kidney function still, you know. I have creatinine of three. Okay. And I would avoid PPIs unless there's another obvious cause for prior interstitial nephritis on her. Right. And so holding the PPI, also holding her metformin, um, so switching to famotidine instead. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so I think now I only have 15 minutes left. Um, so for the third case, uh, is is Doctor is Doctor? I'm here. You are. Are you here. ready? I am here. Yep. yep. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. I I can just do a very brief presentation. So this is a 47 year old gentleman with end stage kidney disease, presumably secondary to hypertension. Um, never biopsied, but did have a serological vasculitis screen done that was negative, both pre and post transplants, um, had been on dialysis since 2017. He underwent a deceased donor kidney transplant in December on December 28th last year, um, basically had a fairly unremarkable post transplant course had some DGF, so needed some dialysis after um, developed a little bit of CMV viremia with some leukopenia, but that was about it, you know, I saw him at his three month time point was ready to discharge him. He had a baseline creatinine of between 1.5 to 1.7. Um, but right when I was about to discharge him on that visit, I noticed that his proteinuria was 1.7. And his proteinuria throughout this three months has been in the 0 0.5, 0 0.6 range, which I initially attributed to just having ATI post transplant. Um, but with the 1.7, I wasn't sure what it was from, so decided to repeat it, and it's still high. I am going to repeat a UACR. I don't have a UACR yet, um, but you know, with that finding, um, we decided to do a, a vasculitis workup again, and then do a biopsy to rule out any pathology. Um, his HLA antibodies, cell-free DNAs, BKs, everything else was negative. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back for a few slides to start with the time zero biopsy. Um, so this is what we uh, saw. There are about 17 to 21 glomerular epilepsy section, and all of them are patent. There's no significant chronic injury, but what kind of causing our eye is there are quite um, some calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules, as you can see here and here. Um, and then there are more example of the calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules here and here. Um, more again. So this is just want to um, give you some idea like it's not like a focal finding. It's 
um, there are quite a few foci. And also I uh, scanned the, the procurement uh, frozen biopsy. So in some tubules, you could have the suspicion that this could be uh, the, the calcium phosphate crystals um, on that section. But it's hard to tell like how, how much extent is involved. And for the time zero biopsy, there is modest immune deposits as shown here. Uh, we don't think it's significant. So the diagnosis for the time zero biopsy, there is AKI and focal uh, calcium phosphate crystals and modest uh, mesangial immune complex deposition. Other than that, it's pretty remarkable. Then five months um, after the transplant, we had another biopsy. Uh, and the main reason is um, there, there is proteinuria and we want to know what's going on with the patient. And this is what we got. We have two cores of renal cortex, about uh, 14 to 19 glomeruli, uh, all of them are patent. So a same, kind of similar to uh, what we saw previously, the chronic injuries are mild. And then uh, again, there are those uh, calcium phosphate crystals. Uh, so this is kind of a lower magnification and the higher magnification to show you the calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules, more of these. And uh, um, IF, it's, there is modest, um, I think IgM and C3, but otherwise not remarkable. And so for EM, um, there is um, segmental protocyte for process effacement and photo remodeling changes. But other than that, uh, we don't see any evidence of rejection, acute rejection. The most uh, striking finding is the widespread um, calcium phosphate crystals and also AKI. Um, ATI and the chronic parenchymal injury is uh, mild, and there's a little bit arteriosclerosis is mild. So I did some literature searching for the um, like calcium phosphate crystals within the um, transplant patients, um, and this this is from a two kidney transplant recipient studies. One of them does show kind of similar calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules, 66-year-old uh, men and stage renal disease. I had kidney transplant, creatinine is one, EGFR 79, and, and he also had all this history listed here. And the post-transplant medication, uh, and then seven months post-transplant, um, he had uh, abdominal pain and decreased urine output. He's also hypotensive, increased serum creatinine to 10, uh, EGFR of 6, and they measure all these um, parathyroid, parathyroid hormone and serum calcium level and phosphorate. So uh, he was in initiated on daily hemodialysis therapy. And this is what we see um, from that case report. So there is similar calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules. Uh, and then um, they did a long cause staining, which uh, could be positive if there, if there is a phosphate and it's positive and as in these black stained crystals, it's quite abundant. And for follow-up, the patient was um, on dialysis and another follow-up biopsy uh, in two months showed uh, the same calcium phosphate crystals and tubular injury. The patient was still like dialysis dependent. Uh, and uh, they also listed some um, risk factors for the phosphate kidney disease um, could be uh, acute or chronic kidney disease, um, transplant, advanced age, volume depletion, um, ACI, ARB, or inside use, abnormal bowel motility, um, and other excess or repeated oral sodium phosphate solution use. So uh, this is another like post transplant nephrocarcinosis associated with, could be associated with poor renal allograft function. Um, so for nephrocarcinosis in the transplant patient, um, from this single standard study, um, they measured all these uh, creatinine phosphate and calcium, they measured all these uh, lab, they did all these lab tests and uh, uh, the use of these um, medications were reviewed so 12 patients had nephrocarcinosis as a primary diagnosis. Average age was 52.2. Um, uh, average time since transplantation is 2.3 years. 
um, based on uh, serum creatinine is 1.34 before the development of AKI. And uh, so for the, so this is more kind of a development after transplantation. It's slightly different from our case because it's present in the time zero biopsy. And for the creatinine uh, at 12 months follow-up was 2.37. So, and one patient progressed to end stage renal disease. So the conclusion from this study is the histologic finding of nephrocarcinosis could be associated with poor renal allograft uh, function. So uh, I think the question for um, this case is first, we don't know what is causing the proteinuria. And second, the, the really like um, abundant calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules, what does that mean to us, um, especially for me, um, when I think about the organ procurement, when I see those much uh, calcium phosphate crystals within the tubules, could that be a, a good donor? I mean, to, because I was reviewing like the donor criteria, could that be a good um, thing to transplant um, when there is diffuse nephrocarcinosis and what is the definition of diffuse? So that's, so kind of some questions I, I have from this case. Um, so I think we still have several few minutes for questions. Um, yeah, I'm open to any questions or comments now. I'm sorry, I was a little bit rushed. <laughs> uh, were the crystals in the distal tubules or on bond, bond cause has stain? Did you do Foncoser stain in this case, Yuan? No, we didn't. Oh, sorry, yeah. this is the... But, yeah, that was, that was from a paper, I think. Yeah, um, that's from a paper. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if, because it was present in type time zero biopsy, maybe patient has some sort of a tubulopathy where patient absor was absorbing a lot of water in the proximal tubules and was getting more concentrated distally and... and leading to calcium phosphate uh, crystallization because it seems it persisted even after transplantation. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and, th and was this patient also on warfarin, Yuhar? No, no warfarin. Okay. Yeah, this, we, we, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Yuan. I, I think what... Um, kind of still a puzzle is, I don't know what is causing the proteinuria and uh, what does this mean when there are, um, I mean, pathologically, there are a lot of calcium phosphate crystals. But I don't know what that translates to clinical. Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether the proteinuria is because of tubular injury. So like this is a tubular, so that's why I'm doing a, a ACR on him just to uh -huh. see he, I only have a PCR on him, um, mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to get him to do an ACR just to see if there's a significant difference, and if this is mainly a tubular proteinuria. Um, I suppose when I actually this is the first time I'm I'm seeing this final um, diagnosis. When I talked to Charlie um, when we biopsied him, I think there was a question of if what we were seeing were calcium phosphate crystals because um, um, I think you know, Charlie was talking about polarization. He didn't see any polarization. He wasn't really sure. Um, but, you know, my question would be, if I'm seeing this, the time zero biopsy definitely is a donor calcium phosphate uh, mm -hmm. problem. So the question right now is, you know, if we're seeing this, is this remnant from the donor or is this something that's perpetuated? by the recipient side. I have to admit he is, um, he does have hyperparathyroid leftover. So his calcium has always been in the 10.3 range, which I felt it wasn't high enough to start Sinocal said, but you know, so the question, the question now is, should I be addressing this a little bit more aggressively? And I, I may um, just seeing the, the deposits. Yeah, so, so let me have, uh, ask this. I think that this, uh, yeah, you mentioned very good points. And uh, you know, continue, continuing what following up on what Abol just mentioned. So in the in the time zero biopsy, uh, they, we usually take just a piece of uh, you know cortex, a more superficial part of the cortex. 
Now, comparing the time zero with this biopsy, Yuan, uh, did we have more like medullary part and deep portions of the of the cortical tissue? And did you have a feeling about the distribution of the uh, calcium phosphate crystals if they're more uh, frequently precipitated in the in the medulla or in the medullary uh, rate, something like that? Yeah, so to answer your question, uh, so this biopsy to me is more like cortical parenchyma. Okay. Uh, don't see obvious medullary parenchyma here. Okay, um, yeah. Is that, I, was, I was wondering that if uh, indeed, I mean, the time zero, because of the distribution, we underestimate it because in order to answer that, whether this is what has left from the from the donor derived nephrocalcinosis versus aggravation of what was present, uh, if we want to compare these two biopsies, do we see an increase in the calcium phosphate deposition now mm -hmm. or not? Um, and if the distribution is, is different between the two? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think um, I think what we can do is maybe do a vancor that's saying to highlight the presumed calcium phosphate crystals that probably help us to uh, see better the distribution as well. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, I was just thinking that could be like some special staining. One, one way we could prove is calcium phosphate. If there is phosphate and the other thing is probably highlight because it's some of these is not you have to like look at them carefully to look for it. Um, yeah, that's just what I was thinking. And I, I mean, I think you can do that, but I, I think it, it's gonna be still very subjective in terms of the interpretation. And okay. I mean, the one thing I would add is that uh, there were a lot of calcium phosphate crystals present in that time zero biopsy, and there's still a lot present. And I don't think that that's too much of a surprise. I and mean, calcium phosphate crystals are not gonna just disappear, you know, overnight. So they, they tend to, to just stick around uh, for a long time and, and maybe eventually sort of get moved outside of tubules as the tubules sort of uh, regenerate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to say, but I, I don't, you know, in my own personal um, opinion, um, I don't think that there's, you know, uh, a lot of reason to suggest that this is an ongoing process. I think that a lot of what we're looking at is probably donor derived. Uh, is there any history in the donor of hypophosphatemic rickets? I mean, it's possible the donor has a FGF23 mutation in the proximal tubules, and maybe that was leading to phosphateria and crystallization distally. That's an interesting point. Yeah. It wasn't something that was brought up, but it's certainly something that I can look into. The The cause of death was stroke, um, but it wasn't, I can take a look into that. Yeah, because like tumor-induced osteomalacia also behaves similarly. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there are a couple of medicines. The burosumab is one of the antibodies against FGF23 that can be used in tumor-induced osteomalacia and low phosphate. So I wonder if similar thing is happening here. Thanks everyone for um, for your participation and the conversation. It's it's nine thirty one, so I think we'll leave it there. I'll just note the the comments in the chat as well regarding Senecalset. Um, so um, so that'll conclude our nephrology grand rounds for this week, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.